everyone. Welcome to the Pillars of Eternity to Avowed PAX West 2024 panel. Thank you so much for coming out today. Let's hear it for Avowed. My name is Tom Caswell, and I am joined by two of the developers of the game. I have Carrie Patel, the game director, and thank you very much. Yes, please. And then we have John Koto, who is an area designer for the game, and we will get more into what the fuck an area designer is in a little bit. Uh, so we have a lot to talk about and show you guys today. Um, and, you know, as the panel states, it's from Pillars of Eternity to Avowed. We're about to step into this new game, but it comes from this, uh, the, these two previous Pillars games. Can I get a show of hands? Who here has played Pillars of Eternity or Deadfire? All right, so we have a lot of Pillars of Eternity fans, so we got to be on our A game. <laughs> um, so we wanted to get uh, the game director of those titles here today, Josh, Josh Sawyer, which uh, you're about to see in the video. I fuck up his name in that as well. Uh, Josh couldn't be with us today, but we do have a video for him, from him, um, before we get to that, though. What is this panel going to be about? So we're going to be talking about Pillars of Eternity with Josh in this pre-recorded video, and we're going to kind of transition into talking about that transition from Pillars to Avowed. And uh, join us to explore the journey from Pillars of Eternity to Avowed. And let's just play the video. Let's get into it. Hey everyone, I am here with Josh. Uh, let me just restart that. Hi, everyone. I am here with Josh. So <clears throat> You know, this. my parents really did not consider the sibilance <laughs> of my name when they picked it for me. Josh. Sawyer. Hello, everyone. I'm here with Josh Sawyer of Obsidian. We are here to talk about the origins of Eora and the Pillars of Eternity universe. Josh, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. We're on the precipice of this game, Avowed Releasing, which has its roots in the Pillars of Eternity games that you led direction on what made you birth Pillars of Eternity <laughs> into this world. So it started with uh, an idea that one of my, my former co-workers, Nathaniel Chapman, had, which was we should have a Kickstarter game. <laughs> um, I think it was around the time that Double Fine had their Kickstarter, and a lot of the people at the studio were really like, we should do something that is kind of a throwback to the games that we made back at Black Isle. And I proposed that we make a game that blended kind of Icewind Dale dungeon crawling with uh, Baldur's Gate world exploration and torment philosophical themes, you know, trying to get all the Infinity Engine games kind of in one, in one game. So really the idea was we want to have a fantasy setting that is welcoming to people that enjoy traditional fantasy, let's say, but also has enough new things in it for players to discover that they're intrigued by the setting and want to learn more about it. I knew that because we were making something that in many ways was, you know, a throwback. And we, you know, we're very clear in our Kickstarter where we are trying to capture the spirit of these older games, you know, that in some ways necessitated, we we got to have paladins, we got to have bards, we got to have rangers, we got to have, we have to have all of these things. So then the question largely became, how do we, how do we include these, but then wrap them within these metaphysical concepts so that uh, they feel rooted in this world. So for example, the idea that wizards grimoires are kind of channeling devices for essence they pull the magical essence from the in-between into their grimoire and then the grimoire shapes it and then they send it out or that the chanters when they are chanting are evoking the ancestral memories of the souls that are sort of fragmented in the in-between and it's kind of like a a call and reply thing where they call out these ancient poems or songs and then the energy in the in-between hears that and remembers it and kind of sends the energy to the chanter to make that real. It was also a very fast process. So if I tried to give you an accurate recollection of exactly what happened at every step, I'd sure. be lying uh, <laughs> because the, the Kickstarter took off 
really quickly and I had to fill in a lot of blanks uh, much faster <laughs> than I was expecting to. What was that experience like of kind of hand, you know, crafting this world lockstep with the community? There's a lot of people that want a lot of very specific things. And I mean, one of the appeals about playing D&D is you know, if there's a character concept, you can probably make it. So, you know, everyone's sort of asking for the thing that they most like in D&D <laughs> or in the old Infinity Engine games to be present. So a lot of demands from a lot of different people, much rather hear those requests directly from the audience early and think about how to accommodate them rather than like kind of do things in the dark until a publisher does a focus test and, you know, like that that whole process that's very traditional in game development. It was nice, especially for a throwback game to interact directly with the fans, even if the fans could sometimes be very spicy. I actually was chatting with, uh, you, you know, your friend and colleague, uh, Fergus, for uh, my podcast, Hit the Limit Break, and we talked about, like, wanting to develop new games like these old games, but obviously the tools and what development looks like now is vastly different from what it was like back then. Yeah. Uh, can you talk to kind of um, the balance <laughs> of trying to build a game that is very much taking inspiration from those old source games, but, you know, balancing out the old way of game <laughs> development with the new. So the process by which we author the levels, I'm not going to say it was easy back in the day, but basically, you know, we would render those levels out and then we would have an artist. Very often that artist was uh, Brian Menzi, who's still with Obsidian. And he would go through and he'd do these wonderful 2D paint overs. And then we'd have what we call a clipping mask to sort of uh, determine sorting. So if a character walked behind something, it would properly sort them in the scene. And then we were kind of done with it. The way that we built them for Pillars and Deadfire was was quite involved. Uh, it involved building the 3D scene, rendering it out. There are all these different maps for dynamic lighting uh, because we actually dynamically light the 2D scene using the 3D data in, in a, actually in a, in a depth map, like a, a 2D image. It's all very technical and very crazy. So, um, I mean, the, the engineers on the team did an incredible job getting the stuff to work. Uh, and it's very impressive, but it was also very time consuming. Kind of our principles of level design in an isometric game where perspective is is kind of tricky. You know, a lot of the rules that we used and and uh, things that we did to help the player and not confuse them in the in the good old days, we, we continue to use because those rules still applied. Um, basic principles of pacing and level design we could still use. Infinity Engine games are old games. And a lot of times when people go back to the old games, the biggest difficulty they have is dealing with interfaces. Pillars and Deadfire, we put a lot of emphasis on saying we want to support all the stuff the player could do, but we want to make it way easier to interact with the world, way less frustrating, a uh, lot, lot less time wasted. You know, I have noticed some people say that they go from the Pillars game and then they go back to play the Infinity Engine games. And even the Enhanced Edition, they it's kind of a, a shock. In your mind, like when you look back on Pillars 1 and, you know, even 2, um, is it kind of aligned with that initial vision? The games wound up feeling maybe more traditional than I expected them to in the end. Interesting. To be honest, we weren't even really that confident that we would get funded. And once we were funded and there were so many backers, they really wanted six abil like attributes, ability scores. And I, I had kind of self-imposed a goal of making sure that all the attributes were useful for all the classes, sure. and which they often aren't in D&D. &D. It was a lot of things like that, like little things that seemed to me to be things that we could easily change. Um, but people were really like steadfast of like, no, I want this, you know, like I want six characters in the party, which I kind of felt was like maybe one too many. Um, and then in Deadfire, we did go down to five, which even though people did complain about it, I still think it was the right choice. But it's a difficult balancing act because we, you know, we posed, we pitched everything as a throwback. So if we deviate too much from the expectations of the audience, which we can't know, we can try to intuit, uh, then they're going to get mad. You know, in some ways, I do think they're a little more conservative with design than I thought that they possibly could be. But in terms of the world and the setting, I'm, the setting I'm still very happy with it. When I was a kid, I remember I got, when I would get like the boxed set for Greyhawk or the boxed set for Forgotten Realms, and I would just read the books. And so I spent a lot of time just reading about the setting 
way in advance of making characters. That was such a formative part of appreciating those settings yeah. that on Pillars of Eternity, I was like, when you're making a character, you see walls of text and like all these names and gods and cultures and wars. And it never occurred to me that people would be like, Hey man, I'm trying to make a character. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're on the precipice of this new release in the, the the world of Aora. What has your experience been like watching the baton pass almost off? Especially because you know it's not like this team is making Pillars Three. They are making a completely different game. Has it been tough to kind of see that as, as you know how personally you are connected to these games, or have you been very much hands off with this experience? You know I. I made this very conscientiously develop this setting for Obsidian. I would be lying if there's not a lot of the things that I personally like in the setting, but I've never considered it to, to be mine. You know, it's, it's made for the company to use. I always give my opinion if I'm asked for it, uh, but you know, it's, we're not making, you know, Avowed is not Pillars of Eternity 3. It's not not for the audiences of Pillars 1 and 2, but it is for a different, let's say, subset or greater set uh, of that audience. It's less about completely recreating something, which is not, I don't think, important and often is not good for the player experience. And it's more about maintaining enough continuity that the IP feels like you know, it's adjacent, like we're we're moving into a different space for the IP to be explored. Well, Josh, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today about Pillars. Right. Yeah, give it for Josh. If he's watching out there. Uh, so we're going to get nice and cozy now, and we're going to speak with both Carrie and John about uh, adapting uh, this world uh, and exploring this new part of Aora with the Living Lands in Avowed. Um, so the first thing I'd love to hear from you both, you know, we talk about with John, with, uh, with Josh, saying, to receive the baton. And both of you worked on the previous titles in some capacity. Um, what was it like being on the other side of them, having to carry pillars into this completely new realm? So I actually started my career at Obsidian as a narrative designer for Pillars 1, and I was narrative co-lead with Josh on Deadfire. So for me, it was very exciting to return to this world that I've loved very much as a developer um, that's really influenced the way that I think about games as a designer and as a narrative designer, um, you know, and to, to explore this setting in particular in the living lands that many of us on the team were very excited about. I think it represents some of the more uh, fantastical and colorful possibilities in mm. the world of Aora. And so for me, it was the best of returning to something familiar and beloved, um, but also exploring and finding new corners in it. What about you, John? So I started my career uh, on Deadfire at Obsidian, but when I saw the Kickstarter for Pillars of Eternity, I was in college, very excited for it, and way too broke to back it. <laughs> um, but when the game came out and I eventually got it, I just fell in love with the world. So when I had a chance to work on it with Deadfire, I was over the moon. And uh, moving to Avowed was like a dream. Uh, games like Morrowind um, are the ones that were very formative to me. So something you know in that realm was exactly what I wanted to work on. Uh, obviously, Again, Josh spoke a lot to the balance, right, of making something that feels authentic to the Two Pillars games, but works for a first-person action-adventure RPG. Um, what are the biggest things in your minds that are uh, defining of uh, Pillars that are very apparent, kind of like in Avowed? So I always think about uh, stories in the Pillars universe as having this very grounded physical layer. Um, you know, the nation state actors, characters, like they're very grounded. Their motives are believable. Um, and, you know, you can kind of feel that dirt under your fingernails when you explore these mm. places and kinds of the forces that drive them. And that very grounded political layer is balanced with this very philosophical, metaphysical layer. Um, you know, it's, there are these stories about gods and their secrets and, and what those secrets say about the people who are, you know, part of, the, part of the living world. And so for narrative, certainly, it's a very rich territory to explore, you know, because you've got kind of these two stories and then always a player character who is positioned between them, who has, 
you know, a voice in the political world and, you know, a voice or a position of importance with the gods and insights. And so it's, it, it's a lot of fun and it creates, I think, a lot of variety in that experience. What about you, Jim? Uh, the metaphysics, I think, are actually one of the uh, most important and interesting parts of Aora to me. Uh, the soul is a very um, prominent feature in the world, essence, the wheel of reincarnation, and staying true to that and uh, making sure we respect what the previous games uh, did is um, I think one of the, the bigger challenges. John, I'd like to talk to you about your role about area designer. Uh, yeah, like what, in a nutshell, kind of what is an area designer? I have no idea. <laughs> uh, no, so... You need someone to explain it to you. Yeah. yeah. Um, I tend to liken it very much to being a dungeon master uh, for tabletop games. It's developing and being the architect of the player's experience. Uh, laying out the spaces they go through, the people and things they encounter, the uh, obstacles they fight, the rewards they get, and being able to uh, properly guide a player through those spaces in a fun way is the core of being an area designer. Um, and to do that, we have to collaborate with the other disciplines very heavily. I feel like half the job is just solving problems with uh, artists, programmers, uh, the narrative team, and the like. And one of the other, you know, you talked about uh, earlier today, you were talking about wearing many hats. One of them is being the unofficial, official law master of everything about Aora and Pillars of Eternity. And many people kind of come to you as like when they have a, maybe have a question about something. Uh, can you just speak to what it's like having to have that kind of responsibility and like how you deal with that? Yeah, um, I, I love it. Uh, I've always had a bit of a steel trap mind for lore. Um, for the, the nitty-gritty that makes settings unique and Aora just captured my imagination. It has so many aspects to it that I enjoy um, and Being the uh, official unofficial lore master uh, Is a lot of onboarding new people to the team answering questions about the lore making sure that we are sticking true to uh, truths we've established previously you, you mentioned the metaphysics as something that is you know, to you at the core of what makes pillars pillars. Um, uh, beyond that, when it comes to the law, uh, do you have some like favorite law pieces that are like, this is the thing that'll get you interested beyond just like gameplay and things like that? A lot. <laughs> uh, I think the uh, political space of Aora is incredibly interesting. The history is very rich. Yeah. Uh, you can dig into it and just find you know, thousands of years worth of history that's been developed for the world. Um, and I think the, the bestiary is another uh, aspect that really intrigues me. You know, we take uh, staples of the fantasy genre like dragons and undead and have our own twist on them. Or, uh, Undead are individuals that have their souls, or a soul, put back into their body, and they degrade from being essentially uh, the settings version of vampires, uh, vampires, to skeletons, mindless, autonomous little uh, killing machines if they don't get essence. And I just think that uh, sort of cycle of degradation is a very cool twist on a normally, you know, simple trope. So, Obviously, we've been talking a lot about pillars, but avowed 100% a completely different experience. There are a lot of new things that are going to be in this game. So, Carrie and John, I was wondering if you could both talk to some of the key things that people can expect that are maybe going to not shock, but like, yeah, are new to this experience. I think from a gameplay and mechanical perspective, one of the things that's different about Avowed is we went with a classless system. So if you've seen some of the previews that we've shown off, um, you might have seen there are certain skill trees, um, but none of your choices in, in those trees lock you into future choices. So you know we've got a fighter-themed, a ranger-themed, and a wizard-themed tree, 
you can obviously specialize in any one of those, but you can also mix and match freely between them. Um, I know in the previous Pillars games, like those are class-based, so you're making decisions early on about who your character is going to be and how you're going to grow them. And for us, very consciously on Avowed, we wanted to make a choice that was sort of based more in encouraging players to experiment, to try different things, to maybe respec if they you know, decide that they want to make a different set of choices, and just to feel free to discover um, kind of the fun and the possibilities and the sync between different abilities and different weapon sets that they could experiment with. Um, both games, I think, at their heart, uh, share this, this core of valuing player expression and encouraging players to, again, try, try exciting things with their builds, um, mm -hmm. just with a, a different approach of saying, here's some very speci specific and specialized builds you can follow, and you're going to follow this theme of a class very closely and find fun ways to, to iterate within that, or, hey, you're going to have a suite of abilities and a suite of weapons, and it's going to be up to you to mix and match and decide what's fun. Like if you want to play a, a fighter with a sword and a shield, that's great. But if you'd rather have a pistol and a shield instead, like that's fine too. Is that something that was just very easy to kind of make happen or because of what was built in Pillars uh, with it being a much more stricter class system? Is there uh, like an explanation in the law or like how it fits into the world or it just it just automatically already fit into the world of Aora, having this kind of, you can kind of be whatever you want at any time. Yeah, so I mean, in the in the lore of pillars, there are certain classes like ciphers where there's the idea that there is, you know, sort of a, maybe an innate set of abilities and kind of aptitudes that really kind of give you the ability to, to exercise those powers. Um, but most of the abilities and classes and pillars, um, you know, whether you're a, a fighter or a barbarian, um, even a wizard, like those are learned abilities. If you're a paladin, that is based very much in your zeal and your belief, which is maybe not learned, but it is something that you could say you choose. Um, you know, so for us thinking about Avowed as a classless game, the idea is still that all of your, all of these powers that you're using are coming from essence, which is sort of the power that you're drawing from your soul and from the ambient spiritual energy in the world around you. Um, but you are just choosing what that path is that you're going to follow. And then John, back to the original question of um, the new things that people can kind of expect. Uh, obviously, I'm sure there's a lot of new law <laughs> that is coming with this game. Um, so feel free to talk about that or yeah, any kind of aspect that you think is worth mentioning. Um, I think the translation of the abilities from Pillars 1 and 2 into Avowed mm. um, has been very interesting. Um, you know, seeing these cool spells or uh, combat maneuvers in first person is very different than from isometric perspective. And of everything that we've done, I think the uh, using the grimoire, being a wizard in particular, is just uh, a very fun experience. Uh, I don't want to say too much about it, but um, it it's worth trying for sure. <laughs> well, it's great that you can do that and not be locked into like, oh fuck, I now I've got to carry this book around. Like, no, I can I can pull up the the dual pistols if I really need to. Um, avowed what the kind of the the biggest fundamental change is that we're finally exploring the living lands, which is uh, a part of the world of Aora that is heavily mentioned in Pills of Eternity. I'm running, I, I, was, I was up till three in the morning playing Pills of Eternity last night to kind of get prepped for this panel, and the amount of times the fucking living lands is mentioned in just the first couple of hours of this game, and so we're finally seeing it. Uh, what to you guys is the, the main differences between what the Living Lands offers comparative to the areas that were explorable in Pillars? So I think there are a couple things. Um, you know, from a, an environmental perspective, from an aesthetic perspective, it's very colorful. Um, and that was something that we had a lot of fun leaning into with the art. And that Matt Hansen, our project art director, um, you know, drove really beautifully for all of us. So we really wanted to lean into the color, the fun, the vibrancy, and also the variety of the different environments you're going to encounter. Like we've shown these sort of gloomy, foresty, swampy environments, and then we've got these kind of highland desert environments. And they're all very colorful, and they're united by these fungal elements that have uh, story purposes that players will discover later. Um, but that was one part of it, and, and I think the other is that it presented a really great opportunity both for us as devs and also for our fans to explore a clean slate in the world of Aora. 
you know, we wanna, we, we're gonna have callbacks, characters, and concepts that are recognizable to our returning fans, but we wanted to tell a story outside of the Watcher's story, and so we wanted to give the player a new character to inhabit, a new set of companions and characters to meet, and kind of a new story to step into. And The Living Lands is sort of this kind of distant frontier that's almost this place of rumor and legend, even to characters in Aora, uh, provided a really great setting for that. John, yourself. Yeah, I think uh, the mystery surrounding the Living Lands was one of the most fun things to work with. Um, like Tom was saying, it's mentioned a lot in Pillars 1 and 2, but most of the time, everything talked about is shrouded in mystery and rumor and uncertainty, so you never really know if what you've learned or been told is actually true. Mm. Um, you know, the fact that you can you know, turn a corner, uh, leave one valley into another, and you're in a completely different biome is a uh, fascinating and unique part to the Living Lands that was uh, very fun to be able to explore. I, I like what you just said about, like, the expectation that people might have of what they've heard in pillars from characters and, and reading elements, and then coming to the Living Lands and potentially things maybe being different. Is that an active element to this game of, like, subverting expectations or is that just something that kind of came about nat kind of naturally and you you think people will be s kind of surprised anyway um i think it came about naturally uh the fact that so much of the previously established information is you know rumor and myth meant that we had a clean slate to work mm -hmm. with um obviously we wanted to stay true to the things that we internally know are established and true to the world um, but I think players going into it will find some things they've heard to be true and present, and some things maybe just completely myth. Ooh. Uh, Carrie, I will hear a note that is about uh, voiceover. So in, in both Geek Pillars and Dead Fire, there, there's a lot of VO. The, the, from one to two, there was a big jump in the amount of, of voice work. Um, and I mean, imagine Avowed is probably an even bigger leap, potentially. Um, what was it like um, being able to bring a lot more voice to uh, the, the, the world of Aora and just working in that space? Uh, it is it is exciting and also a lot of work, and I've been thankful <laughs> every day for uh, the last six months for our producers, Daniel and Caitlin, who have done an incredible job of uh, shepherding and organizing that process. Um, yeah, as y'all might remember from Pillars 1, we would we VO'd um, kind of a handful of lines in key conversations, but not everything. Um, in Deadfire, we VO'd everything, um, and since many of our actors were overseas, for some of us that meant uh, literally 2 a.m. Uh, recording call time um, that we'd have someone on the narrative team usually sitting in for just to provide any context on, you know, pronunciation, um, story context, quests, like, this is just a bark, it's fine, don't worry about it, um, or whatever <laughs> the case may be. But yeah, you know, one of, the, one of the biggest differences between writing for a game, an isometric game like Pillars mm. and Deadfire and writing for a game like Avowed um, is, as y'all remember, in Pillars and Deadfire, we have a lot of descriptive text, and that descriptive text does the heavy lifting that, you know, we didn't have kind of the animation and you know the more cinematic camera style to do. So you'll describe maybe a little bit about what's going on in a scene, a character's expression, their gestures, and you have to confine it. Um, but you have actually a lot of freedom as a writer to really uh, to really define that scene. Um, and in in um, avowed, just like in the outer worlds before this, you know you're really relying on what the player can see in the camera, what expressions, gestures, actions, you know your animation team can support. Um, and so in some ways that does limit what you're able to do, but it also can provide a really smooth and cinematic experience for players. Um, but definitely we got to work with an incredible cast for, uh, for Avowed. Um, there are a lot of characters and uh, a lot of performances I'm extremely excited about uh, y'all getting to hear very soon. So Maybe even sooner than you think. Uh, <laughs> um, so, you know, you, you were talking about like the descriptive text. Like to me, it's something that playing Pillars uh, I actually really enjoyed because there was an element of my own narrative and the way that I was f reading the story that like really felt and the, like the art and the, the storybook pages like yeah it, 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 there's a lot of kind of that element and as you mentioned that is uh, not as present in Avowed because you can have it all happen um, and you know you would we were talking about earlier the fact that. Um, there are a lot of things that you get to do now because of 
the game that Avowed is, where you can take something from Pillars and expand upon it um, and uh, kind of bring a completely new dimension to it. So if, if you could just, if both of you have examples of aspects of Pillars that are coming across to Avowed that have been enhanced in that way. I think uh, one detail that I'm really excited about expanding on in Avowed is Animancy. Um, Animancy is a really cool detail of the world of Pillars of Eternity, and basically it is the science of soul study and manipulation. And in some corners of the world, it's this cutting art technology. Um, you know, in Deadfire, you've got an entire faction, the Valian Trading Company, that sort of runs on Animancy. Um, in some corners of the world, it's blasphemous, um, and many people consider it dangerous, and it is. But it's a really interesting territory to explore narratively because, you know, it's it's like anything else that is, you know, cutting edge and at the a bastion of progress. Um, it offers great promise, but also great danger. And it, it provides um, a real sense of instability in the world. And uh, there's a particular community in Avowed um, where it is uh, founded by essentially anima like a kind of this rogue colony of animancers who left the Valian Republics and kind of formed their, their own little enclave, their own farming enclave, um, you know, where they grow a lot of the food uh, for the living lands and for the other communities in the living lands. And what was exciting about that was kind of getting to explore a different flavor of animancy, a different use of animancy, and just sort of tell some different stories about these characters who've taken this somewhat rogue technology and, and built a community around it. John, do you have a, an example? Um, yeah, so I've always been a fan of dwarves in fantasy settings, and the um, exploring aspect of the dwarves in Ayora, how you know, moving on and pathfinding is almost instinctual to them, I thought was a very uh, neat aspect. And in Pillars 1 and 2, there are a number of um, Park Runin uh, settlements that are in ruins. They've fallen um, and failed that the player can explore. And given the chance to uh, sort of expand on that and avowed where the Park Runin are a, you know, one of the cultures in the living lands and you actually get to meet them and see one of these uh, uh, settlements still thriving or at least still around. Um. In my talks with, uh, when I spoke to Fergus uh, about the game, he was saying how one of the, the big things that has uh, changed toward the end of development is the opening of the game. Um, and, and we were even talking about this earlier, it being a lot more, you know, initially just kind of thrust into the world, it, here we go. Um, and now the prologue is a bit more directed. Are there any other aspects of the game that as we're nearing the, the release next, uh, early next year, uh, in this last kind of, these last kind of stages of development are very different from kind of how they were uh, toward the beginning? Yeah, and it's you know it's interesting that you bring up the prologue. Um, I've certainly found that in the the games I've worked with, worked on at Obsidian, you always do the beginning last um, because it's mm. the thing that you need to land the most carefully, and you want to have the benefit of everything you've learned over you know months and years of development when you start building it. And in fact, for us, you know, the idea of including a pro of a pro prologue um, that actually came about about midway through production. Initially, we would just start the player off uh, in the first region and say, "Fly, little bird." <laughs> um, but we realized that wasn't really uh, that wasn't really giving players the best onboarding to the experience, and so you know we started creating that prologue probably midway through production. And as you note, um, you know we did a couple of pretty heavy passes to really try to land uh, the pacing, the flow, um, you know, in terms of the narrative, also in terms of the mechanics that we're teaching the player and kind of the little arenas that we're giving players to to really experiment with them. But not surprisingly, perhaps, um, another part of the game that we did some pretty heavy revision on is the very end, um, which is also another spot where you really want to make sure that you're landing uh, the pacing. And without saying too much about what happens there, um, there's a lot that happens at the end where we really wanted to, to deliver on reactivity for the player. We want to show you the consequences of the choices you've made, how you've affected the characters you've met, the communities you've passed through, and kind of what the sum total of those choices is at this point. So as you can imagine, 
that's a lot of narrative beats. And it's also the part in the game where you are the most powered up. You know, you've, you've hit your level cap, whatever that is going to be based on your playthrough. Um, you've gotten some pretty cool end game powers and we wanna give you a really neat arena and combat scenario to move through where you can really exercise those. And of course, you know, you're going to be having some really big narrative capstone moments to, uh, you know, close off the story and, you know, make those final decisions and, and really kind of kind of land everything you've experienced thus far in the game. So it's a lot, um, and that requires a lot of fine-tuning of pacing. So one thing, you know, we, we put everything together, and as you can imagine, there was a lot going on in that experience. So when we went through and evaluated again, we kind of stepped back and said, okay, what are the beats that we wanted to deliver to the player and how can we really streamline those? And so we had a, a top-down map, um, you know, that was essentially a, a screenshot, you know, from a, a bird's eye view of that level and said, all right, you know, here, 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 and here, you know, these are the little narrative um, kind of vignettes that the player can move through where if you did these things, if you made these choices, you're gonna, you're gonna experience the repercussions of these with these characters. And then here's where we're gonna have, you know, some heavier combat sections and and then here's where we can break that up just a little bit with some more of these little bite-sized narrative beats. And also, here are pretty two chunky um, you know, capstone narrative moments, and we can actually condense them, condense them into one to really um, you know, create one very impactful moment uh, and kind of keep the player's momentum forward moving. So there's, there's a lot to balance, and sometimes it is easier to see what you need to do when you get everything laid out and you can play through it and you say, right, I see that we have all the pieces, and now we can see what is and isn't working about how we've lined them up. Now that we have them, let's figure out how we want to rearrange them. John? Um, yeah, the, the first region of the game actually underwent some pretty heavy changes midway through development. Um, part of that was the addition of the prologue and how we didn't have to be as strict uh, streamlining the player's experience through the beginning. And um, originally, about half of the first region was locked off to the player. There was no way to get there until they hit a certain point in the critical path. And that was an assumption that we had making a lot of the content or all of the content of that region. But with the addition of the prologue and you know feedback saying that it didn't feel great to not be able to go to these parts, we decided to open that up. Uh, a process we called the great donutification. Um, <laughs> we actually had this region with a big city in the middle and the uh, western half was available. And then we just removed those little barriers and now suddenly the, all the area around the city can be um, uh, explored right from the very beginning. And we had to rework a lot of the flow of quests and uh, you know, the assumptions that we had to fit this new um, possibility. Um, Carrie, you were talking about you know, the end of the game and you, you What's very exciting to me about that is so often I can come to the end of like a, a big RPG and yeah, I find I think to uh, Assassin's Creed Valhalla and you get you can you can get Mjolnir spoiler alert, but you get it after <laughs> you've done like everything in the game and it sounds like you very consciously had this idea of like no we want people at the height of their power to have that experience of. Uh, utilizing it and feeling uh, like this all-powerful being. Obviously, also with RPGs, it doesn't end at the end, right? Like, it doesn't end when the story's over. People will continue to live in that world and push beyond the, you know, the, the, the campaign and, and live in that world. Can you speak to what that experience is of maybe just, like, story's over, now I'm just existing as this incredibly powerful character with all of these abilities. I've got magic, I've got uh, an array of melee and things like that. What is that experience like when people are finished with the campaign? So we do have a point of no return rather late in the story. Mm -hmm. um, so what our hope is, is that players are gonna play through a vowed, make the choices they want to make, build the kind of character that they want to play, get to the end and say, amazing, what if I made different choices? And then try a different character, a different build with a different set of skills, maybe making different choices at key moments and really aligning themselves um, both in their major decisions and also just philosophically um, with different characters and different ideas that are present in the story. Uh, John, we were talking earlier, um, you know, obviously there's a bunch of companions in this game. Your relationships can take on various forms depending on what happens. Um, a lot of focus on, uh, you know, friendships and stuff like this. But I do have a note that just says smut. 
And you brought up smut, and I have heard that there's quite a lot of smut. So if we could talk about the smut. Uh, yeah, so I think, you know, romance and sex and sexuality are very important aspects of any story that um, should be explored to at least some degree. Uh, in Dead Fire, there was a uh, very controversial smut book called The Very Good Farmer, or A Very Good Farmer, I'm sorry. And it was, you know, people found it and loved it, and that is a tradition that I wanted to make sure was carried on to at least some degree. Uh, and so I, uh, <laughs> with the, the power invested in me as one of the uh, sort of part-time writers on the project, yeah. I made sure to insert at least one smut book into the game. Oh, okay. At least one. At least one. Okay, cool. Just so you know, there's, a, there's smut to be found in Avowed. Um, I mean, that is that maybe we answer the question of what area designer is. Yeah. Just hiding one smut book. It's all just uh, a mask to be able to share yeah. smut. <laughs> right. Um, okay, well, thank you for answering these questions. Uh, but we are going to move on to looking at some things. Namely, we've actually got five bugs, everyone's favorite thing about an action RPG. So we've got five bugs that the team has uh, shared with us, and we're gonna take a look at them, and uh, we're just gonna kind of not only see them, but you guys can uh, feel free to talk about. Uh, and all of these have been squashed, all right? So hopefully, well, they won't be in the final game. Uh, so let's, let's get into it. Uh, so the first one, Spalling Punt. All right. Yep, that's a spalling pun, all right, if I've ever seen it, yep. Uh, so can you guys talk about, uh, about this? And, uh, and is there punting, like can there still be some punting in the game? Because this is fun, I love this kind of stuff. But yeah, uh, if you could talk about the spalling pun. Uh, yeah, to a degree there is some, because okay. ragdolling is fun. Some smut, some, some pun. punting, yeah. Um, yeah. But this is just a, you know, a very simple example of the physics engine going wild. Um, these things happen, and uh, as the engine continues to get tuned, we get these sort of uh, moments a bit more under control. Anything to add there, Carrie, or that's it? Sometimes physics be physics, then. Physics be physics. All right, cool. Um, all right, the next one is, what's with the face? And yeah, so here you guys uh, seem to want to uh, so there's like a, the the Mario Party mechanic, mm -hmm. you know, the menu of yeah. Mario Party where you can drag his face. Uh, Mario 64, even. Mm, yep. Is it is it Mario 64, not they Mario Party? Both. It's both. Okay, just want to make sure. I, I didn't have an N64. I'm really sorry. Uh, but uh, so what is yeah, physics? Is that the answer to this one or? Pose asset exports. Pose pose asset exports. Exports. So, okay. A pose asset basically contains the animation data for a particular moment or something that a character is doing. And sometimes when they get exported, they get a little bit derpy. Um, but one thing I really love about this bug is, besides being very funny, um, I think it shows off just how complex even simple things in game development can be, right? Because we are using you know, at least three different bespoke pieces of software. Um, we've got one piece of software where we create the facial rigs, which is where we set the bones in the face, which are all the parts that move and that govern, you know, how and how much and when they move, you know, with different expressions and uh, different lip sync. Um, and then we have our animation software, which is where we actually lip sync and control facial expressions. And that's a different piece of software. And then there's even a different piece of software, which is where we, um, create the physical appearance of characters, you know, the kind of on top of those bones, like what kind of face shapes do they have, skin tones, hair color, you know, all of the details. And then all of that goes into the game engine, which is even a different piece of software. And so at any one point uh, in that chain, if those programs aren't talking to each other the way they need to, if something gets, you know, if, if there's an error in any part of that translation process, you can get some pretty interesting bugs, and these are absolutely so much fun to run into mm -hmm. in the wild in the game, too. Uh, how, you know, you're talking about all these layers to, to something like this. How easy is it, is it always, like, finding a needle in a haystack of, like, trying to find where the issue is, or it's... 
I, yeah. I think it depends. Um, you know, you always start with kind of the easiest and most obvious fixes and work your way out from there. And I am by no means an animator or a tech artist. Um, you know, I believe in this one, the, uh, the animators were pretty easily able to track down just some, some errors in the, uh, the settings for, some, for this pose asset. Um, but we also had one of our own internal tools programmers um, working with the engineers on the side of our facial animation software, which is uh, from another team external to Obsidian. Um, and they were working back back and forth for, you know, at least six months. And again, this is working with, you know, an incredibly strong piece of software and just getting it to, you know, work correctly with our phonemes, um, you know, the face shapes we have. And you've got here a dwarf. Imagine that on top of that, you have humans and elves and then Orlans and Almawa, which look even less human-like. And you have to make sure that everything you're animating, every mouth shape, every expression, that it's going to work with all of those different faces. It's kind of hard to watch 50 times, I'm going to be honest, in a row. Sorry about that. Uh, let's move on. Uh, <laughs> the next one is Water World, uh, the classic Kamikaze in a film. So yes, under the sea. Yeah, so what's going on here? I assume this is not a part of the living lands. Uh, no, yeah. it is weird, and maybe it could be, but no. Yeah, yeah um, part of I, AR for sure. I remember this phase very distinctly. Um, <laughs> we were adding water, uh, a lot of water volumes around the world to you know, be able to properly interact with the elements and for swimming, and at some point, this level and maybe all the other regions too, I, I don't quite recall, just we're all completely underwater. Um, but not mechanically, just visually. And it took a bit of time to figure out why that happened. Uh, so, you know, it, it impacted us a bit, but it was mostly just a, a funny little goof to work around for a time. Do you think this was one of the harder uh, kind of things to, to rectify? Um, I'm actually not sure. Okay. This was um, something that the programmers were working on. This looks like an area, all right? And you are the area designer, so I don't. If you don't have the answer, man, I don't know. Well, like I said, like yeah, I think you're spending is... too much time in the, with the swamp. That's yeah, communicating <laughs> um, with <programmers>. No, <laughs> um, very cool. Unfortunately, this isn't in the, the, the Maybe about two though. This could be. This could be fun. This is what happens when you eat those mushrooms. You find. All oh, right. <laughs> um, Okay, uh, we've got a couple more here. The next one being, excuse me, coming through. This one, you guys, is fantastic. Uh, let's see if even, I had a tough time like seeing what was actually happening here, so let's see. So yeah, there you go, yeah. Uh, so correct me if I'm wrong, rats opening doors, not a part of the law. Just like uh, raptors, they've learned how. Yeah, <laughs> do you have that? Oh my God, clever girl. <laughs> So um, all of our characters in the world, and this is whether it's an NPC or an animal or even something like a critter like this rat is, they all have these different components on them that govern their behavior, that govern the way they move, if they can get into combat, the way they fight and behave in combat. And so a lot of times when we're creating, you know, new actor types, you know, you have a template that you're working off of. And sometimes that template includes a little bit more than you need. Um, so, you know, do most NPCs need to be able to open doors? Yes, they do. Uh, rats do not. And and we realized that that component was on the rats. And so sometimes this is, this is how you find those bugs. There was a, a very funny different version of this that we had for a while where rats also had um, very strong collision on them, I believe. And so you would see them run through these crowds because you would see all the NPCs do this little boop, 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 That's boop, amazing. I'm kind of sad we fixed that one. Yeah, I know. All of these are honestly about two. I'm telling you, this is, you got, you've got the building blocks for the game right here. Um, okay, and here we have the final one. You know, this is, this kind of behavior is the only thing stopping me from getting Chapel Roan tickets. Uh, so what is, what is going on here? Uh, yeah, this little uh, bout of ring around the rosy happening, uh, I'm pretty sure is most likely caused from one of our um, animation proxies. These are points in the world that have animations assigned to them that um, NPCs will go to, to you know, give the world life. And the one standing in the middle uh, is most likely the one that was assigned to it uh, properly. But for some reason or another, something broke somewhere and uh, was just not going to other proxies around. And it was still considered valid for all these other NPCs. And so they try and try to get to this one space that'll never be available. <laughs> 
like at a chapel or own concert. Yeah. Um, so we are obviously avowed. It's we're months away from from launch. It's coming out February eighteenth. Eighteenth. I knew it was one of the teens. Um, February eighteenth, twenty twenty five. How are you guys feeling about launching this game? Finally getting it out there into the world. Is it? Are you? Are you uh, Kind of like, oh my god, there's so much work ahead, or it's is it feeling like kind of smooth sailing toward the end? How where 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 are we personally feeling about that? I'm I'm very excited. So I, I just got back from Gamescom last week, um, where we yeah. got to show the Dawn Treader Quest off to audiences uh, on the show floor and have some hands-on press demos of the quest. And you know, after you work on a game for for years, you know, and most of that work is behind closed doors. You know, you're very hush hush about it. You've got your head down, and you're just you're trying to get things to a state where you're really ready to show off the promise of that game. And there's nothing like getting to finally share it with people and see their excitement. When when they're coming out of the demo room, when they're asking questions about it. Um, so I'm, I'm incredibly energized by what we've been able to accomplish and how folks are responding to it, and I really can't wait for February. Hell yeah. John Rabe? Um, it's going to be an amazing birthday present. Oh. Nine days after my birthday is when we okay. release. Okay, cool. Um, I can't wait to see people's reactions. Everyone get that in their calendars, all right? You've got to wish John happy birthday on the, on the 9th, I guess. Yeah. Um, and, you know, to see all the hard work that we've done finally get, you know, out in the open and for people to enjoy it and react to it. Um, and I particularly am excited for uh, folks to see um, some of the, the, the Easter eggs that I've written into the game. Um, some friends of mine in D&D campaigns have little references oh. to their characters. Oh, so that's, uh, that's something relevant to only five other people on the planet. Yeah. Okay. Well, they are going to love it. And uh, you guys, <laughs> you guys, I'm sure, all will too. Uh, Carrie, you mentioned people finally getting hands on with it uh, last month. Nope, that was also this month in Gamescom in Cologne, Germany. And uh, let's, uh, we got a little video here kind of showcasing what people were going hands on with. So let us jump into the action. Okay. This, this animation is so fire. <laughs> it's so good. Most of my desktop backgrounds are from that. <laughs> the splinter of air. It rests in a shrine deep within this temple complex, beyond the reach of looters, visitors, or indeed, myself. Return it to me, and who knows, perhaps you will meet your expedition along the way. I did not expect you to be so thorough in your explorations. Nevertheless, I am impressed. 
There's nothing to fear. You won't feel a thing. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. Not a bad looking game. <laughs> uh, very excited uh, about that. And uh, you can all uh, wish list the game now uh, on Steam. Uh, so if you I assume I'm going to pick up a copy. You can go do that. Um, but we just want to thank everyone here so much for joining us today. Uh, game comes out February 18th of next year. Uh, everyone have a wonderful PAX. And uh, yeah, we'll see you in the lands, the living lands. Thank you.